Today's this evening's sermon. Thank you for playing. You know, a lot of tragedies going on in the paper with the tornadoes in Oklahoma and the flooding here in San Antonio and you know the, the loss of a 17-year-old. And you know, uh, What do we normally ask when tragedy hits our lives? Why? Why me, Lord? Why? You know, there, there are many here today who have burdens, uh, problems, uh, uh, adversity in their lives, maybe bad things happening. And, and we ask ourselves, why? Why does this have to happen? You know, it, it's been said there are three groups of people in this world. Those just leaving a trial, those in a trial, and those heading towards a trial. Uh, that's, that's how life is. You know, where, where are you this evening? Maybe some of you are in a trial right now. You know, life has its share of trials and, and troubles. You know, there's no such thing as, a, as a, a carefree life or a trouble-free life. So maybe you're asking yourself tonight, Lord, why, why is there all this suffering? Why, why does the Lord send this bitter pain? And we may not have the answer this side of heaven. You know, maybe at one time we, uh, you know, we, we may thought we had it all figured out, but then something happens in our lives and we don't have it figured out. We just have to trust God with, with the answer for, for things. Sometimes we ask, if God is a God of love, how can he allow such pain and suffering? Why do innocent people suffer? Why did this have to happen? Why the, why the suffering? There's a, a title of a book I, I read one time. It says, God, if you have a plan for my life, where were you last Thursday? You know, pain itself could be unbearable if we think there's no meaning or significance behind it. If we're just suffering for the sake of suffering, I think that makes it unbearable. But if there's meaning behind our suffering, if we're suffering for a reason, it makes it bearable, right? We can go through the suffering. And I think we have to view all of our suffering, difficult times, through the, the, the light of the cross. I, I think we need to view our suffering from, from God's perspective, right? Suffering can either make us or break us. Suffering can make us weaker or stronger. It can make us better or worse. It could draw us nearer to God or could pull us away from God. I know when my, I lost my, my wife, I could have gone one of two ways. I could have gone, gotten my heart cold and bitter, and I could have gone away from God. But instead, I drew near to God. Uh, he used a, a, a book that I would not recommend, but he's God. He can use anything he wants to. Uh, I read a book by uh, Rabbi Harold Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And the Lord used that book to soften my heart towards him, and it started me on my journey towards him. I went back and I read that book after I became a Christian, and it's blasphemous. It's blasphemous. I would not recommend that book to anybody. But he knew that was a book I needed at that time uh, to, to draw me to him. So we, suffering can either draw us closer to God or, or, or further away. But suffering, uh, not viewed in light of the cross, I think is overbearing, will weaken us and, and break in us and embitter us. So it's not so much what people suffer, but how we view suffering, I think, is what, what matters the most. So this evening, I want to look at, well, three things about pain and suffering to help us to understand pain and suffering from, from God's perspective. And if you... If you would, turn to Psalm 23, page 401 in your pew Bible. I just can't help but stop thinking about Peter. Peter was doing fine walking on the water. By the way, don't slam Peter, okay, because he's the only one that got out of the boat, right? <laughs> He's the only one that got out of the boat. He's the only one that had enough faith to get out of the boat. But he, was, uh, he started paying attention to the storms around him. And what did Peter start doing? He started sinking. Man, that's our life, isn't it? When we can keep our eyes on Jesus, we're doing all right. But when we start paying attention to the storms around us, we'll start sinking. That's why I love that song, Be Thou My Vision, Lord. He's got to be our vision. We've got to keep our eyes on him during this difficult time. Look at Psalm 23, page 401 in the Pew Bible. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the first thing I want to notice, number one in your handouts there, all will walk through the valley. All of us, none of us are exempt from walking through the valley. How many of you love the mountaintops? Oh, man, I love the time. You know how you get to the mountaintops? Through the valley. That's right. You got to go through the valley to get to the mountaintops. And we can't just stay on the mountaintops, can we? You don't learn anything on the mountaintops. You don't grow on the mountaintops. It's in the valley. That's where you learn. That's where you grow. We don't like the valleys, though. We want to stay on the mountaintops. But all of us are going to walk through the valleys. Um, A in your handout. It's difficult to feel God's love in the valley, isn't it? In the valleys, things feel dark. In the valleys, things feel hopeless. In the valleys, you feel alone. You feel abandoned, right? There's, there's, you feel like there's no end in, in the valleys. B, valleys are a dark and scary place. They're a dark and scary place. I remember when we drove to North Dakota to go see Mount Rushmore. We were driving back, and I never seen so much fog in my life. Remember that? For miles and miles of fog, and we couldn't see. And I had to go like 10 miles an hour uh, just trying to drive. You could see just a little bit in front of you, but it was scary driving through the fog. Why was it scary driving through the fog? I couldn't see. You know, when we're walking through the valleys, it's scary because, man, we just can't see. It's dark. We don't know what's around the bend. We don't know what's going to happen to us. It's a scary feeling, isn't it? It's a scary feeling, very scary. Uh, the valleys here are, are, are uh, um, what David is talking about. It's called the wadi. Jim, what's a wadi? You probably know that. You're, you're a man of facts. You know facts, a lot of facts. A wadi. Yeah, I know you know it. I know you know it. A dry creek bed, right. Wadi, yeah, Wadi. See, I knew you knew it. But, it's, but the shepherd would normally take his sheep through the Wadis. And it's a dangerous place to be as we see what... I remember we're driving across uh, this little creek over here. And I'm thinking, why do they need such a big bridge over this little creek? Uh-huh. Yeah, now I know. Now I know. And that's how the Wadis were back then as they were taking the sheep through the Wadis. It was a dangerous place to be. You had to you fear fat, flash floods. Uh, predators would be on the, the cliffs overlooking the, the wadis. At the, you know, so it was a very dangerous place to be for a shepherd to be taking his sheep through. He had to constantly be walking through uh, uh, on, on the alert, looking for danger. So uh, he, uh, picture this as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He's walking his sheep through the wadi. He can, he can imagine just the danger all around him. It's a scary place to be, isn't it? Very scary. Uh, I'm just trying to catch up to myself. I get way ahead of myself, and I'm trying to... Okay. All right, let's look at number two. <laughs> the necessity of the valleys. The necessity of the valleys. You know, God doesn't cause the pain and suffering in this world. I, I, I heard an interesting fact the other day that your insurance company will not cover hail damage to your car because it's called an act of God. Why don't we call it an act of the devil? Right? Why do we call that an act? And all of a sudden, these, they believe in God, don't they? These insurance companies believe in God. Oh, yeah, sure, when it comes, comes to repairing your car. Right? But we call these bad things that happen in nature acts of God. I'd like to change that. We need to call them acts of the devil because it's not an act of God. I believe there's suffering in this world. Bad things happen in this world, not because of acts of God, because of acts of sin, because we're in a fallen world, right? That's the reason there's tornadoes. That's the reason there's hail, and that's the reason there's hurricanes. And God didn't create this world like this. God didn't create the world with cancer. He didn't create the world with, with sickness and, and death. We, we live in a, in a fallen world. Now, God doesn't cause hurt in this world and pain and suffering, but he can use it. He can use it for, for glory. So I want to look at three necessities of the valley. Three necessities of, of the valley. Do you see number two there? The necessity of the valley. The first, valleys shape our character. Valleys shape our character. Luke 
None of us like that, do we? How many of you like going to the doctor and getting a shot? Why do we do it? Yeah, it, it makes us healthy, right? It protects us. It makes us stronger. Your body builds up an immune system, but it's painful to get that shot, right? Have you ever heard the story about the emperor moth? We're good. Be quiet. Okay. <laughs> okay. A man found a cocoon of an emperor moth and took it home so he could watch the moth come out of the cocoon. One day, a small opening appeared. The man sat and watched the moth for several hours as it struggled to force its body through that little hole. Then it seemed to stop making any progress. To the man, it appeared as if the moth had gotten as far as it could, breaking out of the cocoon, and then it got stuck. Out of kindness, the man decided to help the moth. He took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon so the moth could get out. Soon the moth emerged, but it had a swollen body and small shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the moth, expecting that in time the wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the body, which would simultaneously contract to its proper size. Neither happened. In fact, the little moth spent the rest of his life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings, never able to fly. The man, in his kindness and haste, didn't understand that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required for the moth to get through the tiny opening were God's way of forcing fluid from the body into the wings so that the moth would be ready for flight once it achieves its freedom from the cocoon. And the application is, just as the moth could only achieve freedom and flight as a result of struggling, we often need to struggle to become all that God intended us to be. There's no shortcut sometimes what God intended us to be. Sometimes we wish that God would just remove our struggles and take away all the obstacles. But just as the man crippled the emperor moth, so we would be crippled if God did that for us. God doesn't take away our problems and difficulties, but he promises to be with us in the midst of them and uses them to restore us and to strengthen us, to enable us to be all that he created us and intended us to be. I don't want to be a shriveled up, wingless, fat-bellied moth. I, I, I want to be a big butterfly, but it, it's a struggle to get there, isn't it? You know, C.S. Lewis one time said, Lord, I understand why you introduced suffering in my life to make me a Christian. I understand that. But why, why now? Why now that I am a Christian do you introduce suffering into my life? And he said, Lord, impressed upon my heart, he said, you're content to be this shack, but I want to make you into a castle. You know, so even as a Christian, the Lord may introduce us to hardships, not to, to, to punish us, but to strengthen us, to build us, to refine us. It's, a, it's an ouch process, isn't it, sometimes? It's ouch, right? I just hope that we're, we're uh, what's the word, malleable, the clay. We're not hard and brittle, but we're, we're moldable. He's molding us. And who, who is the clay to say to the potter, I don't like what you're forming, Right? We're, we're in his hands. We've got to trust him, what he's molding, what, he, what he's forming. I'm sure he knows what he's doing, right? But, again, we don't learn a lot on the mountaintops. We learn in the valleys. Did you know that golf balls were first smooth when they were first introduced? And then it was discovered that after the ball was roughed up a little bit, that it would go farther. So now when they make golf balls, they, they have dimples on them. And God uses the rough spots in our lives to help us go farther to make us stronger you know the trees on the edge of the forest are the strongest trees are the most sturdy trees on the edge of the forest why they get the brunt of the storms and they're the strongest most sturdy trees the healthiest trees god will use the the storms in our lives he'll use the 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 dimples the rough spots in our lives he'll use the struggles in our lives to strengthen us to make us stronger to help us go farther farther than we want to go right but he's got plans for us. Paul said, I rejoice in my sufferings in, in Romans 5, 3. Well, he didn't say, yippee, I'm getting beaten today. Yeah, all right, I'm going to jail. He rejoiced in his sufferings because God, he knew God would use these for his good and his glory, to mold him, to help him, to draw him near to God. So Paul could say, I rejoice in my sufferings. I know God's going to work good out of it. Look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 2 Corinthians 11.23. 
Are you there? Amen. Amen. He says, are they uh, servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again. Wait a minute, this is one of God's servants. Now, I thought when he became a Christian, everything's supposed to go easy. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent night and day in an open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, and from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Here was a man that suffered, right? A man of God that suffered. Why? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. I think this explains why a man of God suffers or a man... Uh, a woman of God suffers. Second Corinthians 1, 8 and 10. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered. That we just read, right? In the province of Asia, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. In other words, they were at the point of death. They were despaired, thinking there is no way we're going to get out of this. We're, gonna, we're all going to die, Right? Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Why did all this have to happen to Paul? Why? So that he would not rely on Paul. That he would learn to rely on God. And don't you think after all of this, he had some aha moments. He had some great faith-building moments. He had some markers that he could, he could step up to the next level of faith, saying, wow, I saw God did this. I'm getting to the next level of faith. Wow, I saw God do, do this, right? These, these, you know, these circumstances were just opportunities for God to reveal himself, to reveal his power, his greatness, his majesty. Uh, that's why Paul could say, I rejoice in my sufferings. I rejoice in my sufferings. Why? Because I experienced God in a greater way than I, 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 I could never experience before. But it's through the valleys that I knew God was with me. He helped me. He strengthened me, right? Max Licato writes these words about suffering, and he calls it anvil time. You ever hear of Max Licato? Doesn't he have a church in San Antonio? Yeah. Oh, is that what? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, he writes this. He says, anvil time is not a time to be avoided. It is a time to be experienced. What's anvil time? That's when you take the metal and you, you bang it on the anvil, right? Although the tunnel is dark, it goes through the mountain. Anvil time reminds us of who we are and who God is. We should not try to escape it. To escape it would be to escape God. We got to go through our anvil time, right? That's why he molds us and makes us. I know when I look back on my life and I look through the valleys, I wouldn't want to go through them again, but I wouldn't trade them for the world. It was a hard time, but it was a sweet time. Through the valleys, I've drawn closer to God. I've come to know of his love and comfort in a, in a more deeper and personal way that I just couldn't learn from a book that I had to go through this valley to experience. And I've come to love him and experience his love in, in a mighty way. And uh, I, uh, Tess, I know you have a testimony too. I've been reading on your blogs on Facebook. Uh, how you've experienced everything that I'm talking about tonight, right? Yeah, praise God. He does. Wow. 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 Right. Wow. 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 
Yeah, well, just through the, the testimony that I've read, it's like, you know what, I, I, I know you, you wouldn't want to go through this time again, but you probably wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Praise God. Only God could take the circumstance like that and, and make it good, make a testimony. Thank you for, for sharing with us. And uh, maybe we'll sing what a mighty God we serve when we close. Keep that keep that song in your heart. God uses uh B in your handout. God uses the valleys uh to to uh correct us teach us and transform us god uses the valleys in our lives to correct us teach us and transform us i read a story where a woman was visiting switzerland and she came upon a shepherd with his flock and on a nearby pile of straw was a sheep uh, with a broken leg and her sympathy went out to the sheep and she asked the shepherd how it happened and it, the shepherd explained to her, the lady that he had to break the sheep's leg that the sheep would not obey him the sheep wouldn't listen to his voice. It was a wayward sheep that did what he wanted. and he, he wouldn't follow the flock, and he was starting to lead the other sheep astray. And based on his past experience, he had to, to break his leg. He said, the next day I tried to feed it, but it, it bit me, so I left it alone for a while. And when I went back to it the next day, it eagerly took the food and, and licked my hand. And everywhere we have to go, I, I have to carry the sheep now. And we're bonding. We're spending this, this time together, and we become very close. And I know that when the sheep's leg, when it heals, it will be a model sheep. The sheep will stay close to me. The sheep will respond to me, and the sheep will obey me. And I think God has to maybe break our leg sometimes to, to get us to respond to him, to get us to obey him. It's been said sinners in paradise would never repent. Sinners in paradise would never repent. If God never broke our leg, we would never repent. If we had nothing but pleasure and good things in our lives, we wouldn't give God a second thought. We wouldn't. That's our human nature. When things are going well, do we, do we remember God? I can't count the number of times I pray, Oh, Lord, get me through this traffic jam, or get me through this here. As soon as he does, I'm down the road 10, 20 miles, and I'm thinking, I never thanked him. He got me through it, and I, I never thanked him. How many times do we, we pray, and he answers, and then we just forget about it? See, when things are going well, we forget about God. So sometimes he has to introduce trouble in our lives to, to, uh, to give him a second thought. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, if you want to turn there, page 176 in your pew Bible. I think we need to discern the difference between discipline and punishment there's a difference between discipline and punishment discipline has a purpose discipline builds you discipline enables you to handle life it makes you holy makes you focus on the future punishment makes you pay for the wrong you did focuses on a past mistake and action so god disciplines us He's not, he's not punishing us right now. That's judgment day when we get our punishment. But he disciplines us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, page 176 in the Pew Bible. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because, why? The Lord disciplines those he loves. And punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as a son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? God disciplines us for our own good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, discipline may feel like punishment, but I think the motive behind it is entirely different. God disciplines us because he loves us, to build us, to encourage us. Not to make us suffer, make us squirm. That's not what he's about. But also, if God is not disciplining you, what does that mean? You're not his son. You're not his daughter. So you're not saved to begin with. So if you are being disciplined by God, then praise God. That means you're a child of God. But if, if you're not, well, you have reason to be concerned. And then the third necessity of the valley is C, is to be ministers. To be ministers. 
If you would, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, page 140 in your pew Bible. Have any of you ever broken a leg, an arm, anything? Arm, arm? How, foot? How does it feel? Hurt? And I've never had a baby either. I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how it is to have a baby. I, ha- I, could read, I could read books on it all day, but I have no idea what a woman has to go through. I have no idea what a broken bone feels like. I have no idea. I can only imagine what it's like. But, you know, when, when an older woman talks to a younger woman who is pregnant, you can talk to that woman about a pregnancy and let her know what it's like, and you can comfort her. Why? You've been there. If you had a broken bone, you can comfort someone who had a broken bone. Why? Man, I've been there. I know what it's like. Yeah, it'll heal. It'll be okay. You can comfort them. You've been there. I can't. I've never had a broken bone. I've never had a baby. I can't comfort in those areas. I can try to counsel, but I can't do it as well as someone who has been through it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, page 140 in your pew Bible. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God for, of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Why does he do that? Why does he comfort us in our troubles? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So God sometimes has us go through things to be ministers, to be ministers so you can comfort those who are going through the trials and troubles. Tess, I bet you you're going to be a great comforter to someone down the road, right? You're going to be a minister to someone down the road. Most of us don't want to go through the valleys in in, in life, but God can bring great benefit out to help us to encourage others, console others. Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The Lord is, is with us. You know, in the difficult days ahead, in the difficulties, you will discover the Lord is, is with you. Uh, let's look at number, number three. Number three. Do we, do we finish all the other points on the? Yeah. Okay. It says, His rod and staff will comfort you and guide you as you go through the valley. You see that? Psalm 23, verse 4. His rod and staff will comfort you. What's the difference? Well, look at the page. Turn the page. And I, I just, I did the best I could with the picture I could find, Okay. Do you see that it looks like a, a, a pin? Actually, that's a, more like a club, okay? It's about three feet long, and that's what the, the shepherd would use. You see that on the bottom, the bottom picture that looks like a pin? That's a club, and it has a knob on the head, and they would use that to, to beat predators away. Uh, remember uh, um, uh, David. David talked about how he fought off a, a, a lion or a bear, right, when he came after one of his sheep. This is what he used, his, his club. So they used it as a weapon. It was, it was a rod. And the staff was more uh, uh, for, for comfort and care. Uh, that he would use to get the sheep out of, out of being stuck or something or would use to, to, to lean on. So there's the difference between a rod and a staff. Okay? Two, two different things. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the, so the, we'll look at the rod first. The rod is an instrument of authority, right? It was a rod. It was for, for punishment. It was for power. It was protection, authority. The shepherd would use the rod to protect his sheep from coyote, wolves, and cougars, or whatever. The rod is symbolic of, of God's word in, a, in our life. God's word helped us to repel Satan's attack. God's word is our only offensive weapon, right? The sword of the spirit, which is the... Word of God. That's our only offensive weapon is the Word of God. Uh, in Matthew 4, three times Satan tempted Jesus, and three times Jesus used the Word of God to repel Satan's attacks, right? God's Word protects us from, from false teachings uh, that may lead us astray from harm and, and trouble. 
God's word has, has power. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and the training in righteousness. And the staff, symbolic, this is the one with the hook on it. This is a, an instrument of support. It's, it's symbolic of comfort and guidance. The shepherd would use his staff to guide, gently guide the sheep. And the staff in our lives is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comforts us and, and guides us. John 16, 13, Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into, into all truth. The Spirit guides us down the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Uh, he helps us to walk worthy of the calling we received as Christians. The Holy Spirit helps us to apply God's word to our lives and makes God real in our lives. Psalm 23, verse 1 through 4. Let's read it in its entirety. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you that you have given us your word, Father Lord, to comfort us, to protect us, to strengthen us. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who, who helps us in our time of need, who, who guides us down the paths of righteousness for your, your namesake, that you have not left us as, as orphans, but you have given us your Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So, Father, I thank you, thank you for... Uh, well, just uh, your word that you have given us here tonight and how we're to view suffering and through the lens of, of the cross, that we should view all suffering in, uh, through the lens of the cross, that, that you, you may not cause all suffering, but you, you will work it for your good and for your glory. Father, I pray for those who are in the midst of the storm right now. I thank you for Tessa's testimony. Uh, uh, thank you for how you've been working in J.C.'s life, Father Lord, how you bring him healing and how you spared him, Father Lord. And I pray, Father, that when all is said and done, that, uh, uh, that well, we'll, we'll all be able to sing, What a Mighty God We Serve, because we can see your hand all through this, Lord, how, how you have spared him and how you have uh, uh, just uh, been glorified through this whole process. Father, I thank you that we, all of us, as we walk through the valleys, that we can take comfort in the fact that you are with us. Your words assures us, never will you leave us or forsake us. That we don't walk through the valleys of the shadow of death alone. We don't walk through these dark, scary valleys alone. But you are with us. Help us to remember that. Father, I pray that our, our faith will not, I mean our feelings will not dictate our faith. That even though we may feel alone, that we will, we will remember your word. We remember how you, you have given us your Holy Spirit, how you are with us in the valleys, and how you came to this earth not to deliver us from the valleys, but to walk with us through the valleys. So let us remember that, Lord. Father, let us not our, our feelings dictate our faith in your word. Father, I pray for those who, are, who right now, Father, need to hear this word, that they would capture these promises, capture your word, and put it deep in their hearts and in their souls and in their mind. And that they will take comfort in knowing that you are with them. Father, I thank you that you have uh, uh, just given us such hope through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I had a plan to sing.